Hello, friends. Welcome to the Bible Hour. This is your host, Dr. John Howe, broadcasting from San Diego, California. We're so glad that you could be with us today. And as always, we pray that the Word of God might be a special blessing to you. If you've been following our videos here on YouTube, you know that we've been doing a study entitled The Truth About the Rapture. And while we will continue that series, we are also going to begin a concurrent study of the book of Revelation. Our plan is to go verse by verse through all 22 chapters of this magnificent book, and we pray that God might allow each of us to learn something that will be a blessing to us and help us in our walk with God as we know that we are approaching these last days. Revelation, of course, is a very controversial book. There are many in scholarship that would tell us that this blessed book does not even belong in the canon of sacred scripture. It is controversial chiefly because of its subject matter, prophecy, the end times, and the future fulfillment of all of God's promises. And so, for that reason, many people will try to make excuses for why they ought not to read this book. Many will say that the book of Revelation is a very difficult book to understand. I would counter that the book of Revelation is not a difficult book to understand at all. It is simply a difficult book to believe. However, for those of us that are Bible believers, that accept the Word of God as being perfect, infallible, and inspired in every way, we have no problems with believing every jot and every tittle that's found in the book of Revelation. Now, of course, uh, as always, uh, our approach to the scriptures is literal. Certainly, there are places uh, in Revelation uh, where the only possible application is something that's figurative. But where the Bible can be taken literally, the Bible should be taken literally, and that shall be our approach in this study. Now, the author of the book of Revelation is John the Apostle. This is the same John uh, who wrote the Gospel of John. He also wrote 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. Uh, this is the disciple whom the Bible says that Jesus loved. Now, of course, Jesus loved all of his disciples, but it's apparent that he loved John in a very special way. And so John is that special disciple who was chosen to write this book. Now, the date of the writing uh, is approximately 96 AD. Now, the date of the writing is very important. Jerusalem was destroyed, and the temple with it, in 70 A.D. Many scholars would try to place the writing of Revelation prior to 70 A.D. so that the prophetic statements that are listed here could be fulfilled from a historical standpoint when Titus sacked Jerusalem in 70 A.D. However, that's not the case. This book was written around 96 A.D., right before the turn of the century as John had been banished to the Isle of Patmos for the Word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. And so, therefore, the events that are, uh, that are described in Revelation have future fulfillment. They were not fulfilled historically. And that's something that we need to understand uh, uh, from a prophetic standpoint. Now, this book has 22 chapters. It has 404 verses, and it has 12,000 words. Of course, 12 is a very special number because it's the national number of Israel. And 12 has a special significance in the book of Revelation, as does the number 7. And we will talk about these important aspects of numerology uh, as we continue on with the study. And so the theme of Revelation is certainly the fulfillment of all things. Uh, it wraps up what was began in Genesis. And it shows that the Bible is a full and complete circle as far as the plan of God for the ages. And so that is the theme uh, of this blessed book. Now, something to understand about Revelation is the fact that Revelation is not chronological as far as its narrative. And that's one of the reasons why some people get confused with the book. It's not as though one chapter follows another chapter as far as a chronological order. Uh, you need to understand that uh, Revelation will take you through the tribulation period in particular four distinct times, four separate times. The first time is through the seal judgments. The second time is through the trumpet judgments. The third time is through the activities of the Antichrist. And then, and then still the fourth time is through the vile judgments. Now you may ask, why did God do that four times? Why does he take us through that tribulation four times? Well, think about it. God gave us four distinct views of the first advent of Jesus Christ. We have four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew presents Jesus as the King of the Jews. Mark presents Jesus as the Son of God. And then Luke presents Jesus as the Son of Man. And then finally, John presents Jesus as God manifest in the flesh, the blessed Son of God. And so you might envision it like this. If there was four of us standing at an intersection, and one of us was on each corner, and we all saw an accident, 
It could be said that we all saw the same event, but we would each have different perspectives because of our differing vantage points of watching that accident. And so with the Gospels, God gives us four distinct vantages, four distinct perspectives of the first advent of Jesus Christ. It would only make sense that he would do the same thing with the second advent of Jesus Christ, and certainly that's what he does. And so Revelation will take us through the tribulation period four separate times under these various judgments. Now, another thing is uh, the divisions and the sections that are found in this book. Um, in chapter 4, verse 1, heaven opens and someone goes up. In chapter 19, heaven opens and someone comes down. And so these two openings of heaven divide the book into three sections, chapters 1 through 3, chapters 4 through 18, and then chapters 19 through 22. And so those are the distinctions uh, or, or the sections that are in this book. Now that's interesting because in the Bible there are three distinct people that are addressed in Scripture, the Jews, the Gentiles, and the Church of God. Chapters 1 through 3 very clearly deal with the church. However, after heaven opens in chapter 4, verse 1, there is no more mention of the church. In fact, we find that the narrative switches to the Jews and the nation of Israel throughout the remaining chapters all the way up to chapter 19 when heaven opens a second time and someone comes down. And when the Lord comes back, he comes with the armies of heaven and he, we, we see the bride that hath made herself ready. Uh, and so we see the church appear once again. This is one of the strongest arguments uh, for why the church does not go through the tribulation. In spite of all the DVDs and YouTube videos and Facebook postings that are out there telling you uh, that the tribulation is for the church and the church goes through the tribulation, that is not the case. And the logical divisions found within the book of Revelation are one of the reasons why we know this. And so there are those three divisions uh, within the book, chapters 1 through 3, the church, chapters 4 through 19, uh, dealing with uh, the nation of Israel during the tribulation and their Gentile converts. And then chapters 20 through 22 will show us the Gentiles in eternity and give us the culmination of God's plan for the ages. And so those are some of the things uh, that, that we need to consider uh, as we start our study of this book. And so if you have your Bibles handy, go ahead and take your Bibles and come to Revelation chapter 1, verse number 1. Revelation 1.1. 1, 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and he that, uh, or, excuse me, blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. All right, so the first thing we notice in verse 1 is this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Uh, this is not what someone said about Jesus Christ. This is what Jesus Christ said himself. And so this is the revelation that belongs to Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him. So Jesus got it from God, and then Jesus showed it unto his servants, things which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Now notice he said things which must shortly come to pass. Now that's very important. Uh, there are those that are running around today saying that there has never been an expectation of the church of the imminent return of Jesus Christ. That is not the case at all. We see right here it says things which must shortly come to pass. The author of this book expected an imminent return of Jesus Christ. Notice in verse 3, it says, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. So on the one hand, in verse number 1, he says these are things which must shortly come to pass. And then in verse 3, he says that the time is at hand. And so the early church did have an expectation of the imminent return of Jesus Christ. And certainly when we read the writings of Paul, as far as Paul's epistles to the church, we can very clearly say that there was as an expectation uh, of uh, the imminent return of Christ in Paul's letters, to be sure. And so we see here things which must shortly come to pass, and the time is at hand. Now notice how this will go right along with Matthew chapter 24. 
Take your Bibles, if you would, and come to Matthew chapter 24. And in Matthew 24, look at this passage. Matthew 24, come to verse... Thirty-four. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Now what's he referring to? This generation. This generation shall not pass till all things uh, be fulfilled. Well, it couldn't have been the generation of the apostles because that generation did pass and all these things were not fulfilled. Obviously the context deals with with the generation which begins to see these things occur, that generation shall not pass until all things be fulfilled. And so notice how that ties right in with Revelation chapter 1, uh, verse uh, 1 and verse 3, as far as the expectation of the imminent return of Jesus Christ. Now it says that he sent and signified this by his angel unto his servant John who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Now notice uh, John says that he bear record of the word of God. John's authority was the word of God. And then he says the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now what is the testimony of Jesus Christ? Well, the testimony of Jesus Christ is found in Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19. In Revelation chapter 19, look at this. Come to verse number 10. Revelation 19.10. In Revelation 19.10, John says, And I fell at his feet to worship him, and he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Do you see that? The testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. The thing that sets apart Jesus Christ from every other religious leader this world has ever known is the element of prophecy. The thing that sets apart the Bible from every other so-called sacred literature on the face of the earth is the element of prophecy, the ability to foretell future events before they come to pass. No other religious figure has ever been able to do that, and no other volume of sacred literature has been able to do that. But yet the Bible, countless times, has made prophetic uh, statements that were filled, or excuse me, fulfilled literally as a fact of history. And there are yet prophecies that have not yet been fulfilled that shall be fulfilled. You can read uh, the Quran from cover to cover, and you will never find one prophetic statement that uh, Muhammad ever made that came to pass. You can read the Book of Mormon from cover to cover. And you'll never read one prophetic statement that Joseph Smith ever made that came to pass. Yet, I don't even have time to list for you in this broadcast all the prophetic statements that the Bible has made, many of which have already come to pass, and many more which are yet to come to pass. And so, uh, the element of prophecy, the testimony of Jesus Christ, is the testimony or the spirit of prophecy. Now, in verse 3, he says, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Now, we've already uh, mentioned the fact that the time is at hand as far as the imminent return of Christ. But notice the blessing that's placed upon this book. The book of Revelation is the only book that promises a blessing to the person who reads it or even to the people who hear it. Say, for example, a man is blind and cannot read he can still receive a blessing by hearing the words of this prophecy. And so Revelation is the only book in all 66 books of the canon that promises a blessing to the reader or the hearer. For that reason alone, this book ought to be read and studied and meditated upon. And so that's all the time we have uh, uh, today. Uh, uh, today's broadcast was simply an introduction uh, to get us started. And so we'll take a break with verse 3. Uh, in our next episode, we will pick up with verse 4, and we will continue on as far as our verse-by-verse -verse study of this blessed book. Until then, may the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you, and may he be with you in every way and everything you do. Thank you for watching. In Jesus' name, amen.